Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here. My name is Kevin Fertig, and on behalf of the Strong team, I'm pleased to present to you the fall final briefing for the Strong Act. I would like to thank our academic advisor, Lloyd Cass, as well as my teammates for their invaluable contributions throughout the semester. Today, I will begin by returning to the problem of extreme weather and present to you the solution proposed by the Strong Act. I will describe how we translate legislation into program design, both in the planning and implementation phases, and how this is meant to mitigate the impacts of extreme weather on the ground. Throughout today's presentation, I will draw on South Carolina's 2015 floods as a case study uh, showing the problems emblematic of national resilience planning and what we need to do better in the future. Extreme weather affects us all. As we've seen before, it is a nationwide problem with significant economic and social costs. Over just the past 30 years, hurricanes and floods, droughts and tornadoes, extreme heat and extreme cold have combined to cause over $880 billion of losses and have tragically led to the deaths of over 16,000 individuals. The map here on the right is representative of the geographic spread of the issue. Furthermore, the problem is increasing in scale. This graph, using data from the American Meteorological Society, tracks a number of weather-related disasters that have each cost over a billion dollars in damages. As you can see from the trend line, these billion-dollar disasters are occurring more and more frequently, and we therefore have a responsibility to do something about it and protect our communities from harm. Now, one community that was severely impacted by lack of adequate preparation was South Carolina last year in uh, October. As Hurricane Joaquin uh, advanced up the East Coast, it unleashed an incredible storm directed straight at South Carolina, as shown by this precipitation map here on the left. South Carolina received over six months worth of rain in under 48 hours, causing $1.5 billion in damages and leading to the deaths of 19 individuals. Now, when these events happen, we always ask ourselves, what went wrong? Well, a recent study identified several contributing factors that harmed uh, South Carolina's resilience. First, city and county officials applied inconsistent flood management practices across jurisdictions. Infrastructure meant to divert water away from certain areas was not effectively picked up in the next. And also, officials did not know how to apply flood management practices to private lands, resulting in a pockmarked tapestry of planning efforts across the state. Second, there was a lack of coordination across different levels of government. Notably, state officials were uncertain about the timing and extent of federal financial assistance, and as a result, were not able to allocate resources effectively. Finally, state officials relied on inaccurate local flood maps rather than the more up-to-date uh, FEMA flood maps for the region. They also did not sufficiently engage with the scientific and academic communities. As a result of all of this, we have a senior state official admitting that we probably know less about dams and watershed management than anything else in the state right now. And again, these problems of communication and coordination are common to resilience planning efforts across all forms of extreme weather throughout the country. Now, in order to address these problems, we've identified three main goals as well as three corresponding program components as mandated by the Strong Act. First, we must gauge the status of our current national resilience planning, which will be achieved through a gap and overlap analysis. Second, we must establish a vision for what, a national resilient, uh, for what national resilience looks like, which will be published in a National Extreme Weather Action Plan. Finally, we must empower decision makers across all levels of government to be able to more effectively prepare for extreme weather. And we do so by creating a data portal meant to inform these efforts. Now, the first step, the gap and overlap analysis, seeks to reveal information in four major categories. First, existing and planned resources allocated to resilience. Second, interdependencies between stakeholders and potential areas for collaboration. Third, conflicting policies that currently hinder our resilience. And fourth, resilience gaps in areas that require greater attention. Cumulatively, at the end of this step, we should have a much better sense of the coverage of our current resilience planning and be better positioned to limit the problems that we saw in South Carolina. Now, for the gap and overlap analysis to be effective, we're going to need the input of numerous and diverse stakeholders. This effort will be led by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, which is housed under the Executive Office of the President. 
OSTP will convene both an interagency working group and an advisory group to draw on their expertise. The interagency working group is comprised of 17 federal agencies with climate related budget appropriations. This can include scientific agencies like NOAA, as well as agencies with experience on the ground like FEMA or the US Army Corps of Engineers. The advisory group, meanwhile, is comprised of 16 external stakeholders that can speak to resilience planning efforts across multiple levels of government. This includes state, local, and tribal. Uh, the advisory group can also speak to the interests of multiple industries, geographies, and populations, and special consideration is given to populations deemed most vulnerable to extreme weather. The uh, OSTP will convene both groups on a monthly basis to draw on their recommendations and expertise. Now, the next step is to utilize the information revealed in the gap and overlap analysis to create a vision for what national resilience looks like and we codify this vision in a National Extreme Weather Action Plan. The bulk of the plan will be written by OSTP staff, assisted by a team of external consultants, and will be overseen by the OSTP director. Uh, as per the Strong Act, the plan must be completed within the first 14 months of the program. The goal of the plan is to resolve some of the issues revealed in the gap and overlap analysis, uh, provide guidance on best practices, and seek to better align our, and coordinate between relevant stakeholders. Finally, the act also calls for the uh, creation of a data portal that utilizes the information from the gap and overlap analysis and the national action plan and presents them in a user-friendly format. Decision makers across all levels of government will be able to access information specific to their local context on up-to-date weather models, sources of funding, and resilience best practices. We expect, that, uh, we expect that decision makers across all levels will be able to use this to improve their, improve their planning processes. Work on the data portal will begin in conjunction with the start of the gap and overlap analysis and continue after the publication of the action plan. We be, in order to avoid undue delays or backlogs, we expect 85% of the information revealed in the previous steps to be integrated within those first 14 months, and we also expect to continue integrating new information on a continual basis. Now, after the first 14 months, the Strong Act mandates that every federal agency appoints a Senior Resiliency Officer, or SRO, as well as a coordinating entity to work between them. We have chosen FEMA as a coordinating entity due to their long-standing expertise and familiarity with extreme weather. The coordinating entity ensures that the recommendations of the National Action Plan are being implemented on a federal level and also takes control of the data portal at this point. Again, decision makers across all levels should be able to utilize both the National Action Plan as a guiding document and the data portal for more context-specific information. In the short term, this should translate to an increased number of resilience initiatives and better coordination of funding and resources. In the long term, of course, the goal is to mitigate the social and economic impacts of extreme weather. So to return to South Carolina, shortly after the plan, state officials recognize the need to do exactly this. And Charleston, uh, the city of Charleston published a sea level rise strategy only a few months after the floods that seeks to align sources of funding coordinate strategies with our neighbors, and bring in the input of leading uh, academics. We can see one example of these efforts in practice here as a team of local engineers is building a seawall along the coast as per FEMA resilience guidelines. Now, FEMA, uh, FEMA estimates that for every dollar spent on resilience planning, we can achieve up to $4 in future savings. And if we apply that ratio to the $1.5 billion that were, uh, of damages from last year's floods, we could have saved $1.1 billion, enough to fund the education of over 90,000 students for a year, or over 50,000 days of hospital inpatient care. And we could have saved the lives of many of those who perished in the flood. That's what's at stake here. The the opportunity to ensure that our communities remain protected, vibrant, and strong. Now, this future is well within our grasp, but we must work collectively to achieve it. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you found this presentation informative, and I will now be very happy to take your questions. Thank you.
I'm the Charleston native, so I have an obligatory question. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for that great presentation. And your last slide actually answered the majority of my question. Um, in regards to the Hurricane Yuquin, I was curious as to what the Strong Act does towards uh, informed city planning, because with disasters like this, does the Strong Act focus on resiliency planning towards disasters, or does it also allow for mitigation or adaptation within smart city planning, I ask, because in Charleston specifically, very risky uh, real estate endeavors, you know, on coastal and barrier reef, barrier, reef, barrier island communities um, cause a lot of the flooding. That's an excellent question. The answer is that the Strong Act, just by seeking to mitigate the social and economic impacts of these storms, ha inherently has to focus on both adaptation and mitigation. Um, the idea is really just to coordinate the resources that we've devoted to both in a better and more efficient fashion. So uh, part, of, part of the input of the early stages is to bring in information on local contexts. Uh, so in the case of South Carolina, uh, academic institutions or research institutions could identify areas of particular risk. In fact, uh, the University of South Carolina recently published a, a state social vulnerability map that's meant to better align federal funding to, the, uh, to these issues. So the idea is really just, it, it's, it's not rocket science. We already, we already have efforts devoted to this, but we need to align them better. Thank you, Kevin, for that presentation. I have a general question. I've heard that oftentimes with resiliency planning and natural disaster response that there are some equity issues in terms of which communities get responded to quickly and in a more timely fashion comparing, say, Hurricane Katrina to Superstorm Sandy, for example. So I'm wondering if you came across any of those issues in, in your research and if your program design accounted for that at all. So I want to bring you back to an early slide that just reminds you that this does affect the entire country, but it is certainly true that there are certain areas that are most vulnerable to some of these storms. And that's why during the gap and overlap analysis, bringing in the input of the advisor group, we specifically mandate that special consideration be given to the most vulnerable populations. Um, one of the things that we found in South Carolina is that two of South Carolina's counties that accounted for 12% of the damages uh, got 40% of the financial assistance. And so you do have inefficiencies and, in, and equity issues surrounding this. And it is our hope that by, uh, being, by informing decision makers that we should be able to limit those problems. Hey, Kevin, thanks. Um, a lot has changed from September to now, when we are October, when we did the midterm briefings. And my question is how much like this act is based on extreme weather and climate change uh, acceptance. Do you yeah. think that with the new administration, this bill is going to have problems to get the impact it, it wants? In short, no, um, for several reasons. First. The act itself at no point mentions climate change as a means of building bipartisan consensus. Second, there's a demand for this at the local level. States and local officials are asking for uh, more help in their planning processes. A lot, there are a lot of good intentions, but uncertainty about how to best approach the issue. Also, we're not really creating a new budget. We're not really paying for anything new. We're, al we're really just aligning and optimizing existing and planned resources. So this doesn't require any new funding from the new administration, and there is local demand, and as a result, I don't expect that to materially change in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.